morning. How many of y'all let the Lord break these chains on them? Oh, yeah. Amen. Yeah. Let's give our Heavenly Father a big amen. Amen. Philippians 4 says, Don't worry about anything, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank you for what He has done. Then we will experience His peace. Amen. amen. Now we can all rise with the national anthem. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, I didn't want to refer to the back. I was looking at the song that the band has chosen to sing this morning, and they got one on there's called the, Sav the Savior's Shadow. It says, I'm standing in my Savior's Shadow. He's watching over me. I feel the rain. I hear the thunder as it cries for me. I'm standing in my sacred shadow. Grace will lead to where I'm free. I take his hand. We walk together, and his light shines over me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord God, that you are walking with us, Lord God. You're holding on to us, Lord. You care about us, Lord God. You cry for us, Lord Jesus. You intercede us before us before the Father, Lord, this morning, Lord. Father, we thank you for who you are, that you are the chain breaker, Lord God. You are the way maker, Father. We thank you for all those wonderful things that you do for us every day, Lord God. And help us always to be mindful and always to thank you, Lord God, and be respectful for those things. Father, today we pray for those that are sick today, Lord God, in the hospital or wherever they might be or sitting at home, Lord God, want to be here. Father, pray that you just lift them up and let your healing virtue flow out to them, Lord God, and restore, Lord God, and help it to be a speedy recovery, Lord God. We thank you for those things. Father, we pray for our service today that you'll bless Pastor Dale and your word, Lord God. Let it go forth, Lord God. Let it be the thing that we need to hear, Lord God. Help it to turn our spirits towards you today, Lord. And Father, we thank you so much for the band and the things, that, the songs that they choose. I know that it's the Holy Spirit working with them, Lord. I pray that you continue to bless them, Lord, in all the things that they do for us and, and the praise that they lead us in. Father, I pray for our children's church and all the other ministries that are going on around us in our Calvary church today, Lord God. And help us to always seek your wisdom and know that it's by your good grace, Lord God, that we are saved and it's by your keeping our, that you hold on to us. We thank you for all these things, Lord Jesus. And God, we just we give you all the praise and all the glory for it all. We ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Last Sunday, Linda did a great job in singing, Linda was in singing, how great thou art. If you were here, I know you felt that. I don't know what pleases the Lord any more than in his house, his people, standing shoulder to shoulder, singing How Great Thou Art. If you will go to the YouTube, if you haven't already, last Sunday it was the second song, you can hear the whole congregation singing How Great Thou Art. And we are thankful for that. We love it when you sing with us. And I'm just telling you, on that last course, the glory of the Lord came down. So it pleases the Lord when we sing to him in song, not only in us, but in you. So sing with us now as we sing Jesus on the main line.
out for God and telling him and praying and just begging him that this world would change.
Only Matthew says that he was young, and only Luke says that he was a ruler. When we put all three of these together, we come up with the story of the rich young ruler. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible, and certainly one of the most popular ones as well. As this passage opens, Jesus and his disciples would no longer minister in Galilee. They had left the region of Judea and were headed toward Jerusalem. Jesus was going there for the very last time. Not only was he going to the city of Jerusalem, but he was also going to the cross. He was going to face a very cruel punishment time and then the worst death imaginable on a cross. He knew that all of that was going to take place, yet he still went towards Jerusalem. On his way, a man ran up to him and fell down in front of him and said, Good teacher. All of this was unusual. Very unusual. Probably caught many of those who were watching by surprise. Some people believe that this man may have been trying to flatter Jesus with the way that he approached him. But I believe it's more likely that he was showing respect for Jesus. He asked Jesus a very important question. It was a question to which he really needed an answer. And it was a question that all of us need to know the answer. He said to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life. Now most Jews would have known how to answer their question based on their teaching. They would have said to have eternal life, you just obey all of the law, follow the commandments, and you'll have eternal life. But this man may very well have heard Jesus teach, maybe in person, and heard him say that there was more to it than just obeying the law, more to it than just keeping the commandments. Now, we don't know for sure, but it may be that this man inherited some of his wealth from his family. <clears throat> if that were true, then it would only be natural for him to ask Jesus, how could he also inherit eternal life? Maybe he thought that just as a person inherits wealth from his family, he could inherit eternal life from his family or through his family. It's interesting here that the term eternal life occurs frequently in John's Gospel, but only here and in verse 30 in Mark's Gospel does it appear. I think Mark wanted to make sure that the emphasis was on the quality of the life, not the quantity. Now look at Jesus' response in verse 18. First of all, he asked the man, why did he call him good? And Jesus then said that only God is truly good. When Jesus said that, he was not saying that he himself was not good. He wasn't saying that he was not divine. Certainly, he wasn't saying that he was sinful. He was simply pointing to God, his Father, as the supreme example and as the source of all goodness. In fact, as uh, James said, all everything that's good comes from God. Throughout all of his life, Jesus pointed to his Father, gave him the credit, gave him the glory, praised him for everything that happened. And when Jesus said that only God is good, I think that's what he was doing at this time. For the Jewish mind, only God was really good. In fact, he was so preeminently good that they hardly ever used the term to apply to anybody else, only to God. And Jesus was doing the same thing here. But then notice what happened next. Jesus called the man's attention to some of the Ten Commandments. Here he called his attention to those commandments that have people relationship with other people. There were other commandments, of course, that dealt with people's relationship with God. I think the thought here was that if people <coughs> obeyed the commands that dealt with their relationships to God, then surely... Those relationships with other people, those commandments, would also be obeyed too. Notice in verse 20 that this man said he had kept these commandments from the time that he was very young. 
And Jesus did not deny that the man had kept the letter of the law. What Jesus did here was to ask the man to do something specific that would demonstrate that he was willing to obey even the spirit of the law as seen in these commandments that Jesus had just mentioned. What Jesus was doing here was calling this particular man to a higher level of obedience than just simply obeying the, the letter of the law. Let's read what Jesus said next in verses 21 through 22. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done, he said. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face failed, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Here Mark said that Jesus felt love for this man. It wasn't just a superficial kind of affection. It was a genuine love for him. And it was based on the man's need, not his worth, not his value or his merit, and certainly not on the response that he was about to give. Jesus knew what he was going to do. And Jesus loved him anyway. The one thing that this man really lacked was complete devotion to God. If he had had that complete devotion, that would have shown in his compassion and his sharing with the needy people around him. But there was no evidence of any of that at all. Jesus told him to sell all of his possessions and give the money to the poor. Now put yourself in that position right now. Suppose Jesus through the Holy Spirit said to you right now today, I want you to sell everything that you have, take the money, and give it away to those who are poor and needy. What would your response have been? What would mine have been? For many of us, it may have been very similar to the response of this man in the story. We have to understand that this specific command is not something that's to be applied to all believers of all time. It was a specific instruction that Jesus gave to this man at this time. He was trying to get a point across to this man. And this man did not like at all what Jesus had to say. We cannot ignore what Jesus said. Even though it doesn't apply to all believers, we can't just do away with it. A lot of people have to give up things in order to serve Jesus as he's called them to do. It may be a vocation. It could be a lifestyle. It could be a relationship. It could be any number of things that they have to give up. But this call from Jesus is not a call to poverty. It's a call to discipleship which can be, and very often is, costly. It involves sacrifice. It involves obedience to the Lord. It involves following the example of Jesus. And as we're about to see, this man was not willing to do that. So again, how do we respond to that kind of situation? Discipleship also involves reward. That's going to be looked at a little bit later. Jesus told this man to do what he had just told him. Sell everything, give the money to the poor, and then leave everything behind and follow him. I believe that if this man had really trusted in the goodness of God, he would have known beyond question that what Jesus had asked him to do was the very best thing that could have happened. If he had just done what Jesus told him to do, but he would not do that. Look at his response in verse 22. Mark said, at this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. This was not the response that Jesus wanted. 
It's what he knew he would get, but it wasn't what he wanted. We can just imagine the disappointment on this man's face when Jesus told him to sell everything and give the money away. He was so disappointed, Mark said, that his face fell. We can just imagine the expression. As his face drooped, maybe he bowed and said and thought, that is not the answer that I wanted to hear. And then Mark said he went away and he was sad because he had great wealth. Some translations say great possessions, some say wealth. Some interpret this as meaning he had, he had even estates that belonged to him. Whatever it was, it was worth a lot of money. And it was worth more than this man was willing to give up in order to follow Jesus. A lot of people who have read this verse and see how this man, man went away and was so sad. They have become sad just by reading. In fact, some people have referred to this verse as the saddest verse in all of Scripture. This man was face to face with Jesus. He heard an invitation from Jesus in person to follow him, but he refused. As the old hymn said, this man was almost persuaded. He was right there, right on the threshold of following Jesus. But he was not willing to give away what he had to sell it and give the money to the poor. Because of that, he was sad and turned around and walked away. This man's priorities were earthly, not heavenly. Where are yours today? What kind of possessions do you have? What kind of priorities do you have? Are they earthly or heavenly? Let's read verses 23 through 27 now. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. This amazed them. But Jesus said again, Dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. This situation became the occasion for a very important discussion of Jesus and his disciples. What Jesus said about riches was just the opposite of what the Jewish people thought. For them, wealth was something that was a blessing from God. It was a reward for being religious. If you were wealthy, it meant God looked upon you with favor. So what Jesus said was completely revolutionary for the Jewish people. And by the way, it's revolutionary for us today too. Because in our society, that's not the way that we look at it. Jesus said it was very hard, it was difficult for a rich man, a rich person to enter the kingdom. You see, so often the rich people who have all of their needs met and most of their wants, they begin to feel self-sufficient. They think, I've done this all myself, all by myself. I don't need God. I don't need anybody else. Everything I've had, I've worked for, I've earned it, I've gotten it, it's mine. I don't need anybody. I don't need anything else. And so they turn away from God. Very often they will feel empty down deep inside. There is a void there. And they try to fill it in other ways. Oftentimes, it's not just rich people, but rich people in particular may try to fill that void by going out and buying things. They may buy clothes, saddles, horses, cattle, houses, trucks, cars, all kinds of things to try to fill the emptiness, the void that they have, and they can't do it. It's been said that every person 
has a God-shaped void, in, void inside of him that only God can fill. Riches, possessions, all these things that we may want or may have, they will not fill that void inside of us. Only God himself can do that. The riches of people often lead to their downfall. There's nothing wrong with riches. There's nothing wrong with money. The Bible says it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Again, it's where is our priority, earth, earthly or heavenly. Now look at verse 24. Jesus said again that it was hard to enter the kingdom of God. But in this verse, he didn't say it was hard for the rich. It could apply to everybody. Not just the rich, but those who were not rich as well. I think Jesus was saying in this passage right here that people could not enter the kingdom of God on their own. No matter who they were, what they had, they could not do it on their own. Their possessions had nothing to do with it. They could only enter the kingdom by trusting Christ as Savior and Lord, like we talked about last week. They had to trust Him and Him only to provide salvation. It wasn't impossible for anybody to be saved, to have the gift of eternal life, but it was very difficult, especially for the rich people. Now think about it this way. Look at the example that Jesus gave. He talked about a camel and a needle. For these people, the camel was probably the largest animal they'd ever seen. How many of you ever seen ever seen camels? Many of you can't. Anybody ever ridden a camel? A few people have. A few people have. I read just this week that I think it was in Tennessee. A camel killed two people. They are thought of as beasts of burdens. They also carry people, but they can get mean and wild. And this particular one, I don't know the circumstances, but attacked and killed two people. So they, they can be mean. They are large animals. They're probably the largest animals these people had ever seen. I think about a sewing needle. It's pretty small. The eye of that needle is extremely small. Probably the smallest opening to anything they would ever seen. Jesus said, think about this, it's easier for that big camel, as large as he is, to go through the tiny eye of a needle than it is for a rich person or anybody else to enter the kingdom of God <coughs> on his own. In fact, it's impossible. That camel can not go through the eye of a needle. A person cannot enter the kingdom on his own. It happens only through faith in Jesus Christ. You see, God, who is good, as Jesus said in verse 18, wants everybody to have the gift of salvation. That's what John 3, 16 says and so many other verses. He wants every person who has ever lived to accept his gift of salvation. He offers it freely, but we have to make the decision to accept it. So the disciples asked Jesus, well, based on what you said, who is going to be saved? How can anybody be saved? That's when Jesus said, humanly speaking, it's impossible. Nobody can be saved by their human efforts. He said, but with God, everything is possible. With God, everybody can be saved. That's how it is possible. Now let's read verses 28 and 29 and see what Peter said and how Jesus responded. Then Peter began to speak up. We've given up everything to follow you, he said. Yes, Jesus replied. And I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property, then look at what he says next, along with persecution. Then he said, and in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be the least important then, and those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. 
Here again, Peter seemed to be the spokesman for the group. After Jesus said what he did, Peter spoke up and said that they had given up everything to follow Jesus. Now, this may or may not be an exaggeration. They had given up their occupation. They had given up their families to follow Jesus. <coughs> We can't know for sure Peter's mindset at this time, but I can just imagine that when he said what he did, there was a certain amount of selfish pride involved. I can see Peter saying, Lord, would you just look at us? We've given up everything just to follow you. Lord, do you realize how special we are? Not everybody's going to do that, but Lord, we have. We left it all behind so we can follow you. Lord, you're lucky. We, we're following you. <laughs> I wonder if sometimes maybe we have the same attitude. Maybe we become selfishly proud of what we've done, what we've given up. But when we stop and compare that to what Jesus gave up for us, what he did for us, then we need to be ashamed and humbly bow before him gratitude for what he's done for us. Jesus assured the disciples that anyone who gave up something valuable in order to follow him would be rewarded. They would be repaid even in this life to start with. Jesus said a hundred times. Now I don't believe that Jesus meant this literally right here. The first thing he said was if you give up a house if you give up your house to follow Jesus, I don't think he's going to give you a hundred houses in return. If you give up a thousand acre ranch, I don't believe Jesus is going to give you a hundred thousand acre ranch in return. What he was saying here was, no matter how much we give up, no matter how valuable it is, no matter what it costs us, it's so much more than worthwhile because of what we get in return in salvation and the blessing we get, that God gives us in this life. Then that person, Jesus said, would also have eternal life and have rewards in heaven. He will bless you. He will honor you in this life. But more importantly, when you get to heaven, eternal life itself, that's the reward that we're looking for more than anything else. All these others are beside the point. But then Jesus warned them again that they would also have persecution in this life. Not only would they have blessings and rewards, not only would good things happen to them, but they would be persecuted. Jesus had told them, if I'm going to be persecuted, and I am, I have been, I will be, then you better be prepared because you're going to be persecuted. Jesus wanted them to know that was the price of discipleship. They would be persecuted. I think he emphasized that again here so that people would follow him, not selfishly for the rewards, but for what God would do for them in eternal life. He went on to explain that in the world to come, the values of this world, as we've talked about before, would be reversed. Those who seek status and importance in this life won't have it in heaven. But those who are humble here will be great in heaven. I think probably the people that would be most rewarded and greatest in heaven will be those that humbly serve God here by serving other people. Jesus came as a suffering servant. That's what he expects us to do as well. And he will bless us, he will honor us for doing that. Now what, is, what does all this mean to us today? What does this passage tell us? How can we take what happened in this passage in Mark and apply that to our personal lives today? I think this entire section that we've looked at emphasizes that riches can make it hard to enter the kingdom of God. It can make it hard to have eternal life. But the rewards of the discipleship are worth so much more than anything that we might ever think of. In 
fact, they don't even compare. Now, understand here that Jesus did not teach that wealth is evil. He did not teach that poverty was better than riches. He did not teach that only the poor could be saved, not by any means. What he did teach was that discipleship is costly. He wanted his disciples and others who were around him to understand that to follow him, it was going to cost them something. In fact, it could be very costly. He wanted them to know that very often, wealth is a hindrance to the gospel, to accepting it, to following Jesus' call to be a disciple. It's all a matter of priority. Are they earthly or are they heavenly? Now let me make that a little bit more personalized. Think about yourself. Nobody else, just you. What are your priorities? Where are they? Are they in getting things, possessions, bank accounts? Those items that you can use in this life, but when this life is over, they will be over too. They will be done with. Or are your priorities on heaven? Things that you can do for God while you were here. Ways that you can serve other people. Ways that you can follow Jesus in discipleship, no matter what it costs you. Again, once this life is over, everything that you've got here is gone. If the world still exists, somebody else will get it. But what you've done for the Lord, your rewards will last eternity in heaven. What are your priorities? Earthly or heavenly? If they are not heavenly, would you ask God and would you let God Help you make them heavenly right now. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We know that everything that's in there is true from beginning to end. Father, so many of us are like this rich young ruler. We don't want to give up what we have to serve you. Father, for many of us, our priorities are earthly and not heavenly. Father, help us to change it. Help us to allow you to change our priorities. So that the main thing that we have as a goal in this life is serving you and being your disciple. Father, we realize that the first step in being a disciple, becoming a disciple, is where a person to accept Christ as their Savior and Lord. And Father, for any folks here right now who do not know Jesus as Savior, we pray that this would be the time. That your Holy Spirit would do his work of convicting and convincing of sin and righteousness and judgment. Father, I pray that these people will come to trust Christ as Savior and Lord right now. That they won't just be almost persuaded, but that they would give in and follow you. As you continue with heads bowed, eyes closed, would you evaluate your own life right now? Do you know for a fact that you have trusted Christ as your Savior and Lord? If not, would you do that right now? You can do that by praying a very simple prayer any way that you want to. You might say, God, I know I'm a sinner, but I'm sorry for my sins. God, I ask you to forgive me for every sin in my life. I know that Jesus is your son. He died on the cross and was raised again. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and life. I ask you to be my Savior and Lord. And right now, on this Sunday morning, I open my heart and life and I accept you. I want to be your 
the servant. I want to serve you as my master. Be the leader. I'll be the follower. If you pray a prayer like that, no matter how you worded it, if you meant it from your heart, God's word tells us that he heard your prayer and answered it and saved you. If you did that, would you thank him for it right now? But if you have not, would you do it right now as Jackson begins to play? If you have never trusted Christ, would you do it right now before you leave? The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Maybe you've already done that maybe years ago. Maybe you're faithfully serving him. But if not, would you begin to do that right now? Is your emphasis still on earthly? Priorities are heavenly. Would you let God make them what He wants them to be? <clears throat> As Jackie continues to play that old hymn, Almost Persuaded, would you listen to the words? It says, Almost persuaded, now to believe. Almost persuaded Christ to receive. Save now some soul to say, Go, Spirit, go your way. Some more convenient day, only I'll call. Almost persuaded, come, come today. Almost persuaded, turn not away. Jesus invites you here. Angels are lingering near. Prayers rise from hearts so dear. Oh, wonder, come. The last verse says, Almost persuaded, harvest is past. Almost persuaded, doom comes at last. Almost cannot avail, almost is but to fail. Sad, sad that bitter will, almost. Folks, please don't go away being almost persuaded and walking away sad. Trust Christ today. He'll give you blessings and rewards more than you can ever imagine. It's the most important decision.
give all praise and we give all glory to you. 